Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Our reflection this morning is based on the reading from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 10, which I shared with you just uh, a moment ago, and uh, I want to highlight the last two verses once again. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. Today we are getting an opportunity to overhear some traveling instructions that Jesus gives to his 12 disciples, the apostles, before he sends them out on a preaching mission. And I, I assume that it's not comprehensive and that he has also explained to them uh, how to preach and what to say about the kingdom of God and his arrival. But what we have of his instructions are uh, uh, these words about being prepared for the hostility and the suffering that they will encounter. This is one of those passages where we, we read this and it, it might make us feel uneasy or, or a little bit uncomfortable to think about because especially those words at the beginning of his instructions and then uh, the, the words that just follow me, where, where this passage leaves off, we could have gone on for a few more verses and it, and it just goes from uh, intense to more intense. But he's saying, brother will surrender brother as if, you know, as so to the authorities and father will betray his children. And what kind of father would do that? And that's what he says. And then children will turn against their parents for the sake of the gospel. He's not talking about just any random dissolution of the family. But in particular, for his sake, these things will occur, among other things. What he does not say, and, and, and I assume that he explained to them or that they knew from their experience, is that preaching the gospel, the good news of free salvation to God, that the, that the eternal Son of God will become a human being and dwells among us, that that message would bring about uh, repentance and the forgiveness of sins, that it would reconcile injured party to injured party, and that it would bring healing, healing to people in their minds and in their hearts and in their bodies. Uh, one of the hymns we're going to sing uh, during distribution, Just As I Am, has this lovely line that I've always appreciated because it talks about healing of the mind. We in the church, I think, talk so much about the forgiveness of sins, which is, of course is the heart of the gospel message. But some of your problems, some of the things that you're experiencing don't quite fit within the, uh, the sort of law gospel dynamic so, so evenly. Because sometimes we are the victims of crime and the victims of sin and the victims of chance. All of it, of course, under the umbrella of our fallen nature. The healing of the mind. I imagine people are hearing, perhaps for the first time, about how they can have a peaceful relationship with the Creator, their Heavenly Father, and experiencing a release, a sense of relief and peace of mind. We Christians know that we don't need necessarily perfectly trouble-free lives. We experience the same hardships as anyone else. In some cases, maybe more. But the peace that passes understanding comes from having God within us. For Christ conquers the world. But he doesn't tell, we don't, that's not recorded for us here in our lesson of the day. All that <coughs> wonderful blessedness that will happen when they preach. What he records is, you will be persecuted. You will suffer for my name. You'll be called all sorts of horrible names for following Jesus. Uh, you know that sounds, that sounds a little, 
you know, it's that word that maybe you knew, maybe you didn't know, Beelzebul. Um, the scholarship on that means that it probably means Lord, basically means Lord of the Demons. Uh, it's, uh, like, or Lord of the Lord of the Flies is, I think, a more literal translation. To be honest. And, and uh, who did they call? Who were people calling the Lord of Demons? Jesus Christ. And if Jesus Himself, our Master and our Teacher, who was without flaw, did not always receive um, open arms of welcome, and was not only was Jesus at times ignored, but at times he was hated. That's maybe as Christians in our time and place we find that maybe a little hard to understand that followers of Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ would be the object of hatred. But he was, and that's why many wanted him to be dead. And Jesus is saying that just as they would call him the Lord of the demons, well, we're not better off than him. We also, as bearers of his name in the world, may at times receive the opposition of the world. And we should not be surprised when this happens as if something strange were occurring. We shouldn't make an effort to offend. We shouldn't make an effort to be obnoxious. And Christians do need to learn at times how to be tactful in explaining who we are and what we believe and why. We have to be tactful and we have to be winsome as much as we can. But we are also called upon to be faithful and true and steadfast to God and His revealed word in the Scriptures. And at times, no matter how pleasant you are, no matter how kind and lovely and peace-loving you may be, there may be times when you simply are the object of derision. They call Jesus names, we will be called names. We will be misunderstood. Nothing frustrates me more. Well, probably some things frustrate me more. But uh, one of the things that frustrates me a lot is when I read criticisms of Christianity. And not, I'm not going to stop there because at times we do need to listen to our critics. I actually think that that's prudent. That we should at times listen to our critics. Even if we ultimately disagree, we should listen to our critics. Sometimes they may see things that we don't realize that, that we're coming off in a certain way. And that, that can be a useful insight from time to time. But whenever I read our critics, critics of Christianity or critics of uh, religion or of belief in God, when they get it wrong, and say, you know what, I don't believe in that God either. That person, that's frustrating. It's hard to be misunderstood. It's hard to be have motives attributed to you which are in fact not your motives. We do this all the time. Let me give you a tip. When you're in an argument with someone, never presume to know another human being's motives. That is arrogant beyond description. I don't even know what my own motives are for half the things I do. It's not possible, possible to judge another human being by their motives. But we will be judged. We will suffer ridicule and rejection at times for following our Savior. He's telling us to be prepared to brace yourselves for these things. Because no matter how loving our rhetoric can be and how gentle and humble our demeanor might actually be, the disciples of Jesus Christ are going to get the door slammed in their faces. They may even, and throughout history, and even today in certain places, they get beaten, arrested, and at the extreme, even killed. Despite bearing a message of love. And that is what the Christian message is, right? It is the message of love. The love of God. Not that we love others, or that we love God, or aren't we great with how well we love one another, or that we gotta love ourselves, or anything. The love that we uh, are driven by is the love that comes from God. Though we are unworthy in our sin, God demonstrated his love by sending his son to die on the cross. You've been died for. If you hear nothing else from me in a sermon from week to week, I want you to know that. That you, whatever your sins have been, great or small, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses you from them all. 
And He not only cleanses you from the sins you've committed, He cleanses you from the shame and the hurt of the sins that have been committed against you too. But even though we may de declare our message of love, we will be heeded. And despite our transparent witness to God, Jesus is saying the disciples will be called devils. The hardest part of this, and like I said in the, in, the, in the verses right after this, is where Jesus says these very, very difficult words about uh, uh, division within families. And I don't want you to think when you read these things that Jesus is not concerned about the health and the stability of your home. It is not God's will for husbands and wives to be in opposition to one another. You are to be each other's greatest advocate on earth. If you want to know the lessons of mercy, it starts at home with your parents, with your spouses, with your children, with your neighbors, and extends beyond that from there. So God loves the family. God loves all people. But He established marriage and, and blesses it uh, according to His will with offspring. And these things are good and they're praiseworthy and they're noble and they represent divine mysteries. And yet, there will be occasions when perhaps one spouse is a believer and the other is an atheist or uh, children have an, a, 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 a conversion at, at uh, um, later in life, your parents don't share their religious view, their Christian view, or whatever. Sometimes you will have those things, and I have known examples, and I, I won't go into the anecdotes because I know I've told some of them before, but I have known people who have told me that their whole entire family accursed, cursed them and counts them as dead because they were baptized as a Christian. It does happen. So you want to ask why? You know, what is it about the gospel message that gets uh, people riled up? What is the basic source of the irritation? And like I've been alluding to in this sermon, we have to admit that sometimes it's because we, as the bearers of the gospel, are ourselves glaringly unchristlike. It's uh, quite easy to uh, throw darts at uh, people from the past. They can't defend themselves. But in history, we do know that, that uh, Christian folks have uh, done some pretty terrible things in the name of the church or in the name of Jesus Christ. People have, from time to time, done despicable things but thought they were serving the gospel. In cases like that, you want to talk about those uh, great and glaring instances which have occurred and may yet still occur, then it's a, it's a little bit understandable why some people might focus on those things and despise you. You know, I, I tell people that when I wear my collars, you know, I do wear my collar frequently around and about town most of the time. Let me tell you, if I want to be undisturbed at Starbucks, I take off my collar. Because when I have it on, I will get people wanting to talk to me. And I see that as part of my ministry, by the presence of Christ in the world, in, in a way. So, it's um, a lot of positive, but I've also been still. So it can happen, right? You know, it can happen. So it makes sense when people are objection, objecting to uh, the glaring failures of individuals and communities. But today, in this reading, we're not talking about that. Jesus is not saying, oh yeah, you know, when you, uh, when you try to force people to convert with the sword, they're going to hate you. They're going to call you bad names. He's not talking about when they do bad things. He's particularly talking about when they're fulfilling their calling as apostles. So it's not just when the church does everything bad that we receive the hatred of the world. Sometimes it's when we're doing everything right, when we're doing everything good. The heartbeat 
attribute of the gospel, as you know, is grace. God's unmerited kindness towards sinners. His, his loving and, and merciful inclination towards fallen, weak, and impotent human beings. And with grace is love and forgiveness and hopefully joy and peace. Not perfectly in this life, but it's there. Hope, hope, because we know the future is bright for us. And these are commodities. Forgiveness, hope, love, joy, peace of mind that we would think that people on the surface would really want. And that they would clamor and break down our doors in order to receive it uh, through the preached word or the gospel in the sacraments. But what might be irritating, what, in fact, what is irritating, even to us, is what lies underneath that message of forgiveness of sins. God's message of forgiveness is wonderful news. Unless you are of the opinion that you do not need to be forgiven. Then, it's insulting. Have you ever uh, offered to forgive someone when, uh, or, or maybe someone's offered to forgive you when you didn't think that you did anything wrong? Suppose, a, a hypothetical, I come up to somebody and say, hey there, Floyd, I would like to let you know that I am I'm forgiving you. And I want to be reconciled with you. I'm forgiving you for that uh, completely rude and inappropriate thing that you said to me. And if Floyd just happens to believe that he said nothing that was even remotely out of line, his response to me may be quite well, not what I expected. Maybe, well, you can take your forgiveness. Because I didn't do anything wrong. Knowing about the forgiveness of sins, it does implicate us in sin. Which many people uh, would deny having an issue with. I don't want to be, I don't want us to focus on it. I mean, I don't want us to become uh, sort of the stereotypical fire and brimstone revivalist, uh, Bible thumper, and uh, hell and damnation. But, friends, the gospel must predominate. Sure, the good news must predominate, sure, but we do at times need to hear that very sober and true of our own spiritual inadequacy and our spiritual death. It's kind of like um, when you try to help somebody when they don't want to be helped. You know, nothing is more frustrating than watching someone really struggling along. But if you try to give them money if their problem is financial, or if you try to assist them physically, uh, it's difficult to receive help. There's people that I think probably are struggling with depression, or bipolar disorder, or similar things. It's simply don't want to acknowledge that they don't have total control. That can be very painful to admit. A surgeon and a doctor can heal you. But he may first have to cut you. He may need to injure you in order to make you well. And there is a similar dynamic with the good news of Jesus Christ. He must break our hearts of their pride in order to bind them up and make us His. That we can shine with the power and righteousness of the Holy Spirit. Final comment on this uh, interesting passage. This is the bit where he talks about the sparrows. I did as, as it happens, I did this week. Like, well, I saw on the grass a dead sparrow. It's Monday, I think it was. Monday or Tuesday. And it wasn't until later that I thought about this. I just walked on by. I didn't break down in tears. I didn't, you know, call the authorities, 911. You know, 
know, and try to organize a funeral, or I mean, maybe when I was seven years old, I might have done that, those things. But I didn't, I didn't see that. I actually didn't think about it until later on when I was studying this passage from Matthew chapter 10, and I thought, how mindless we are about the death of a bird. But Jesus makes the point of saying that even though maybe plus a million sparrows are going to die today, He knows every one individually. And He loves His creation. But you are worth more. You are in a different category altogether. You are the pinnacle of His creative work. You bear the image and likeness of Him. You are more precious than many sparrows. So, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid when people resist you. Do not be afraid when the world appears to be going down the tubes. Do not be afraid when you're discouraged in your Christian walk. Do not be afraid because your Lord Jesus Christ, who has conquered sin, death, and hell for you, gives you those gifts freely and with great abundance. In Jesus' name, amen.